Uh, hello, everyone. I'm Robert Blumen. Welcome to the panel, the first panel. The title of this panel is Muddling Through Armageddon. The theme of this panel will be international financial markets and investing. We are very fortunate to have four outstanding panelists on the panel. You've, you've um, all heard their introductions prior to their talks today. I um, will be working from a list of prepared questions and some questions that have been submitted in the question jar. There will be another panel tomorrow, so if we don't get to your question today, there's a, I promise that Jeff will get to it tomorrow. He's asking me not to use up the entire supply of good questions today, so I need to leave some for him. So um, let's get started. Uh, I'm going to talk a little bit about some of the themes that have come up today, and then I'll ask the panelists to start responding, and hopefully we'll get some interesting discussion going. Just to set the, the stage for how I see the international financial system, uh, it's hard to talk about anything without talking about everything, so I'll start somewhere. The United States consumes far more than it produces, and we save very little. The difference is made up by debt. Most of this debt is financed by foreign central banks, they, uh, in particular, the Asian central banks are trying to peg their currency exchange rates in relation to the dollar, so they need to constantly, in foreign exchange markets, purchase dollars with their own currency. A lot of this they do in the process Professor Hoppe described. They print their own currency in order to purchase our debt. So uh, over time, we've seen a staggering growth in what are euphemistically called reserve assets, which means dollar-denominated debt held on the balance sheet of foreign central banks. It consists mostly of U.S. Treasury debt and agency debt. Agency debt are mortgage-backed securities issued by Fannie and Freddie, which are repackaged home mortgages. So indirectly, we have foreign central banks funneling um, money into our housing bubble. Foreign central banks are very generous. They're not asking for much. They're willing to purchase these enormous quantities of debt at very low interest rates, it artificially low interest rates, as Dr. Shostak has explained, which has led to um, bubbles in all kinds of risk asset classes in the U.S. market, real estate, stocks, and bonds. And uh, as foreign central banks print their own currency to buy our debt, it's driving boom and bust cycles in their local economies. So um, it's kind of kind of how I how I see things. Uh, I'd like to start um, with pan panelists uh, respond to the following quote from the Financial Times. Awash in a sea of dollar debt, the world now finds itself in short supply of tangible goods, and the opportunity cost of not transferring these dollar paper claims into hard assets is too great. Uh, would anyone like to comment? Is, is that a plausible uh, hypothesis of where the dollars will go or or um, on the other side, or when, uh, well, I'll stop there. Would, Frank, would you uh, like to address that theme? Okay. Now, uh, I'm not so sure whether uh, people will agree with me or, or the panelists will agree with me, but the way I look at the value of currency uh, is not in absolute terms. In other words, I don't, rely, I don't regard uh, the liquidity, plenty of liquidity in America, uh, whilst I ignore the liquidity in other countries. We have to, to look on a relative per, per basis. And as far as uh, my analysis are concerned, uh, what we observe that other countries printing as, as fast as American also, right? If you take, for instance, the Eurozone, uh, their money narrowly defined money supply on average uh, for the last six months was at around 10%, right? While American money supply was on average, the, the Austrian money supply definition was about 6%. Now, if you take take con contrasted against the real economic activity, we, we have heard already that the uh, Eurozone is not that healthy at all, in particular the most uh, largest economy, Germany, is in trouble uh, or hasn't been performing since the unification with East Germany. So uh, on balance, uh, I cannot really see why American dollar should be in trouble just based from the purchasing, relative purchasing power parity point of view, right? Now, uh, we... Uh, uh, but. Uh, so on, 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 as far as the long-term basis, uh, I'm not that uh, convinced 
that the American dollar has to collapse against something which is, which is also very weak. In other words, what we have is the following situation. We've got, uh, uh, let's say, Eurozone and, and America. They're both sick, right? The question now, who is relatively more sick than other? If somebody is more sick than I am, then I'm regarded as healthy, right? In absolute terms, we're all in a big mess, right? So what we should be talking is whether there will be breakdown of the entire monetary system. That's really what uh, of interest to me. Mm -hmm. And movement towards gold rather than talking about some kind of artificial system, which is the current paper standard, which is a fiction. And uh, unfortunately, lasting already 200 years, right? But I believe that we are not far from a situation where this monetary system may not last. And that's okay. really what I'll be more okay. interested in. Anthony, do you have any comment on uh, Frank's, uh, Frank's response? Well, one, <clears throat> one could actually agree with his diagnosis that we have both major areas, economic areas, as being diagnosed as relatively unstable, or not to call them uh, in, in great uh, trouble. And it's really uh, a, 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 yeah, a race uh, which one is, is less unsound uh, <clears throat> so how 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 will be the the escape uh, anyone who watches markets i think has always had the opportunity to observe that things build up uh, over a long period of time and uh, the indicators as we have heard today show clearly to some kind of unstable an unsustainable situation, and one just looks at these things in amazement and wonders and uh, things keeping on in the same direction. So there seems to be an inertia in, in markets uh, somewhat. And then there comes, uh, well, a catalyst or a small event, and things change suddenly. A new, yeah, well, a new look at things. Probably uh, in terms of human action, one could see this inertia uh, within ourselves that we love our worldviews. Yeah, that's what, where we get used to. And it's a hard process to change our worldviews. And I think it's similar to markets. So uh, I, I, I live right now in Brazil and it, it, for me it was a total surprise how still in love Brazilians are with the US dollar. It's still for them the greatest currency in the world. So it, it was a clash with my worldview, but it will take them, I guess, uh, five or ten years more to change their worldview as to the U.S. dollar. So sometimes it takes radical things, radical and, and shocking uh, events that we, we just try to build up a new uh, look at things. And we are approaching to that, but nobody is able to tell the inflection point. Yeah. Well, something that actually I'm pondering that's kind of interesting here. One of the failures Russia went through, really all her history, she's never developed a decent banking system. This has really held the country back. It's been a big problem. And since 91, you know, they did not make any progress. They still don't have a decent banking system. But what will it be if the U.S. dollar really does begin to decline seriously because you know, maybe it's good they didn't get in it, in those banks. Maybe they're, they'll be able to withstand a collapse better than any other region in the world. Uh, I know certainly their citizens are not up to debt, to, up to their eyeballs in debt, because they never could get the banks established and start the consumer lending and all the credit uh, expansion. So, I mean, I don't know the answer to this, but it might be something that will interest okay. us all in the future. Yeah. So these, um, some of these comments are leading toward a, a theme that I wanted to cover, which is really the title of this panel. Um, I think we could outline three views that people have about the world economy. One is that everything's great. The U.S. is the destination of choice for all investors, and that our trade deficit is a sign of how strong our capital markets are. I think I'm just going to dismiss this view out of hand. It's espoused by Laffer and Kudlow, because the people buying our debt are not buying our stocks and it's central banks who are not profit made it profit motivated. It's private investors. So, um, moving next point in the spectrum would be the muddle through economy, which is a term used by financial writer John Malden. He says 
things will be bad, falling real income, inflation, energy crisis, recessions, but it'll be kind of like the 70s and we'll get through it somehow. And then um, there'll be a third view that the system is unstable. We're heading towards some sort of uh, what we might call a dollar crisis. It would be a currency crisis centered around the breakdown of the current system. So um, I have a quote from Robert Rubin, that great Austrian economist. The traditional immunity of advanced economies like America to third world style debt crises is not a birthright. Would any of the panelists like to uh, stake out an opinion on the um, muddle through to Armageddon spectrum of where, where you think we're going in the next, let's say, three, three years? Frank. It will not surprise me, for instance, that uh, the uh, noise from the past is that uh, despite all the uh, gloom and doom predictions by the Austrians and by uh, various other uh, bearish Keynesians, for instance, uh, somehow things were, were, were okay. Uh, in other words, again, uh, as I said at the beginning, we shouldn't confuse structural issues, which can be with us for, for 50 or 60 years, uh, with the daily life. And the daily life, again, as long as the kit is still, it's, there is something in the kitty left, what, what, that's what I call the pool of funding, uh, central banks and, uh, and various uh, policies of this government, central bank, they can get away with murder for a long time. As long, uh, a good example, for instance, if you take a company, it's got, let's say, 10 activities, and three, th- three of those activities are losing money, seven making money, right? So this company will be okay, right, as long as this is the case. God forbid, it will be a reversal now, and we'll have seven losing, and only three making profit, then we're in trouble. Now, nobody can tell me today whether America in this particular situation, probably there are still uh, enough entrepreneurs, smart guys, that in spite of all the bad policies, they're still generating wealth. Otherwise, we'll be all in, in, in a hell of a hell of mess. So, all I can suggest to you that we can, uh, uh, those Keynesian guys may, may be right for wrong reasons, that we can muddle through in other three years and maybe we can do very well. Uh, that doesn't mean that on a micro level that we send and there are no misallocation of resources, etc. But from money point of view, anybody who focuses on structural issues and misallocation of resources will end up losing money. That's really all I'm trying to tell you, right? So you have to be very careful with that. So Chris, um, actually, you may have something you'd like to say. Uh, and I'd like to add um, for you to consider, does the value investor care about macro forecasts or um, do you just go about your job and look for what's cheap and avoid what's expensive? Okay, let me try to answer that by picking up something that uh, Dr. Shostak just said, with which I agree. A lot of the points raised from my point of view thus far are imponderables. I wish I knew, but alas, I don't. Very quick homily, though. Uh, late last year, making a long story short, uh, visited uh, the head of a family firm in a regional part of Australia. This family firm had been in business for roughly 40 years, has no credit rating because it's never borrowed a penny in its life, has a 30-year-plus record of generating cash uh, in the proper sense, in the accounting sense of the term, uh, consistently and quite well. And it occurred to me in the context of an unsuccessful attempt to invest in this very successful medium-sized family business that come hell or high water, whatever happens to, for example, the Australian dollar, the New Zealand dollar, the US dollar, uh, someone of that experience, someone with that degree of uh, knowledge and demonstrated ability to respond to consumers, will work out some way to do the best he possibly can under those circumstances. So getting to your question, um, if one had um, an extremely firm basis on which to act on the basis of forecasts, that's fine. Alas, I don't think that I do. So the effort is incessantly to look at the micro level. If one identifies entrepreneurs of the ilk that I've just described, businesses with the characteristics in which I'm interested, then if you like, the, um, the hypothesis is that more often than not, irrespective of whatever unanticipated sorts of events, financial markets or economies um, toss our way, irrespective of all sorts of other things we can't conceive at the moment, there'll be people who, in a sense, with skin in the game, it's a family business, it's their baby, it's their life's work, uh, they'll derive somehow, by some unintended means, by some un- unanticipated means, uh, a method to work it through. So the basic answer to your question is yeah. to, if I had a firm basis, yes, I don't, so I'll, I'll uh, lessen reliance on those sorts of forecasts and concentrate on, if you like, micro values to the extent which I can identify them. Yeah, I would just add one sentence, and I agree with this again, that uh, uh, the trick here to be, uh, as f- from what I understand, 
is because, uh, in the, my speech I said, when Fed injects money, the first recipients are enjoying. So try to be first recipient of money. Okay. That's the, that's the idea. Don't be the laggard. Let's Step go. in the front of the line. So, Chris, so, um, suppose, uh, so said, well, you're an Austrian. You have this great theory of boom and bust cycle. Why not look for, why are you a value investor? And why are there so many Austrian value investors? Why not look for the bubbles, buy them on the way up and short them on the way down? Why not, you know, take advantage of that instead of uh, throw up your hands? Why not short the bust? Absolutely. In other words. Yeah, well, okay. go long the boom and short the bust. Right. Follow the Fed's trail. Okay. My simplistic answer is, alas, nobody rings a bell, either at the top <laughs> or at the bottom, or at least no one, uh, certainly I, I, I can't do so reliably. Secondly, to... Slightly flippantly, but I'm still, make, still making a serious point. Shorting is a difficult business for several reasons. First of all, you have, you have to identify what to short. Easier said than done. Secondly, stretching my metaphor a bit, you have to find someone who's willing to lend to you. Easier said than done on acceptable terms. Thirdly, shorting is a very time-sensitive business. Um, your shorts can go wrong. Uh, so the, the response to your question is because nobody's going to ring a bell and because shorting introduces even more imponderables uh, than I'm familiar with, my Short answer uh, to your question would be, it's simply easier, it seems to me, to stick at a, at a micro level. These sorts of businesses I've described don't occur, uh, or one doesn't encounter them frequently. When one does to um, um, kick the tires carefully, look under the, the bonnet very carefully, the, the hood very carefully. Um, uh, if one has strong grounds to believe that one you know, has a basis on which to invest, then to do so. Uh, but it seems to me shorting uh, adds so many additional imponderables, the ones we've been discussing, that by and large, um, that sort of naked speculation, more often than not, will, will go awry. Okay. So, um, Anthony, you wrote in one of your papers that uh, debt crises eventually come about because interest payments overwhelm the stream of income that's required to uh, keep the currency pegged. We've seen a lot of emerging market debt crises where uh, their debt is denominated in dollars, and so they devalue and improves their import-export situation, but it makes their debt situation much worse. The U.S. is in the unique situation being able to print their way out of any debt problem. What, what are the implications of this? How do you see, is, is this debt sustainable, or is there an end in sight? Uh, what, what usually happens in, in a debt cycle, that in, in the beginning, the... Uh, Current account deficit grows, uh, grows because of the import of goods. So this is the pleasurable time for the economy involved. You simply get more goods from abroad without, without actually producing something as a counterpart. Yeah, so you can really feel richer. One item within the current account accounting of the balance of payments is interest payments. Interest payments are counted in the service balance. And after a while, of course, when your external debt position is growing, the interest payments are growing. So this is actually the point where you can have, if, as long as you don't have, want to have an, an explosion of your debt, and, and if the debt really goes into the vertical, uh, nobody will lend anymore. So then you have what we could call a crowding out, a crowding out of the real imports. Yeah, instead of having real imports, goods from abroad, the current account deficit is still growing without receiving more goods. So this is really a bad situation. This is the, the point where usually uh, the economy starts to tank and foreign investors get their jitters and pull out. Yeah. So that's what okay. we could observe uh, over the past uh, more than 25 years in all these debt crises. Well, I think we might be in that situation now because the current account deficit has been growing as currency falls. So what happens next? Well, uh, we are steadily approaching uh, to this crisis point without any doubt. And uh, the only question is when it, when it comes. It can come any time. It can uh, take some longer. And then we have this need to adapt. But here, actually, I'm probably a little bit more optimistic than uh, uh, the, 
the, the doom and gloom prophets because we could also observe in all history actually that uh, this kind of you know, catastrophic uh, occurrences do not lead to a paralyzation of the people. On the contrary, the, let, let's make a scenario. Let's uh, calculate with some really a shocking, as I said in my talk, actually neither Europe nor Japan nor China want a dollar crash. So maybe it will be uh, much more moderate. But let's assume in the next couple of months or by the end of the year there's really some kind of stock market crash and the e economy uh, tanks. Uh, at the same time, yeah, people just recognize this new situation. It is a positive catalyst for people. Okay, I have to reduce my consumption. I have to turn towards other uh, activities in terms of avoiding imports because they have just become too expensive. A new entrepreneurial spirit will arise. The whole economy will reshift to the new situation. Yeah. So, of course, uh, sometimes, like uh, these things, expecting a decline of the dollar, expecting a stock market crash, actually can have some, some positive uh, effect if it does not get out of control and if the governments, when it happens, do not panic and do the wrong things. Mm -hmm. That is the real danger. As to the pure functioning of the business world, uh, a drastic short shock has happened in the 17th century, in the 18th century, particularly in the 19th century. Yeah, they were short and deep, the, <clears throat> the, 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 these economic shocks. And after that, the, the economy was somewhat rejuvenated. Yeah, it was only in the Great Depression when, when the governments wanted to avoid it and wanted to, to, to ameliorate it when all these problems occurred. And that's the, the great fear in our mind of the, of the Great Depression. Yeah. So, um, thank you, Anthony. Uh, Anne, um, you've written quite a lot about uh, financial crisis in emerging markets, the World Bank and the IMF. The difference between those and a dollar crisis is that they had debts denominated in dollars, which they could not print. So, how would, um, how would you see a dollar crisis playing out, and how would the IMF and the World Bank respond? Would they put together a bailout package for the United States? Or? Well, that, it makes no sense for the IMF to, to bail out the United States because the U.S. is the greatest yeah. shareholder of the IMF, and the only way uh, to, to get out is to adapt. The economy, there is actually no financial pa package available for the mm -hmm. United States. So, uh, simply put, uh, United States is not Argentina. <laughs> You can yeah. put together a bailout package for, for, you could have, so we have to say it was not put together, yeah. uh, okay. and that was a, a, a good thing, uh, to, 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 okay. to interrupt like this moral hazard process. For the United States, there's actually no lender of the last resort available. Mm -hmm. It's only the United Stealth, uh, uh, States itself, which is its own lender of the last okay. resort. And, uh, so printing, just printing of new money would not, would not uh, really help the U.S. economy because the most terrible thing uh, to hit uh, an economy, a modern economy, is inflation, higher inflation. So that's surely not a way, mm. a way out. You, it would be a write-down of debt simply no? due to the devaluation of the dollar. The, the big losers, actually, yeah, Will be the creditors, yeah, because the. Uh, okay, so, Anne, um, would you like to comment on anything Anthony said, or on the subject of a dollar crisis in general? Well, something that's kind of, I just returned from Ecuador, and they're celebrating their fifth year anniversary of dollarization, and so there are very issues with this. Uh, the greatest quote that came out of that was a businesswoman up in the Atavalo region who. I was asking her about it, well, how is it five years on? And she said, well, it's not a happy little banana republic anymore. But really, price rises, uh, wages did not follow. There have been a lot of problems. But one thing that was pointed out to me was that when they dollarized, their private debt immediately doubled. So, okay, if we go the other way and the dollar collapses, uh they could actually benefit because they would be in on the debtor side. Mm -hmm. 
it could actually pay off for a little Ecuador should the dollar go. Is that uh, so? Is this Frank, am I correct there? I don't know. Look it up. <laughs> I don't know. No, no. I, I basically uh, view it differently at all. Uh, the, 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 this whole aspect of the uh, dependence of the, the the American dollar and the and the other currencies in an emerging world market, emerging markets. Uh, for me, first of all, we have to take into account one thing: that all the central banks today are operating under the guidance of Mr. Greenspan. First of all, right? They inflate together, they move together, they operate as one central bank. So if American dollar were to collapse, I can assure you all the other, everything will, will fall apart. There's no such a thing that, that the other currencies somehow uh, will be strong. I mean, uh, I believe that, uh, that, that there's no such a thing as a strong economy today. And Adrian Day, as in his uh, marvelous speech, has shown that he cannot find value in any country in the world today, right? He explicitly shown this. That uh, confirms at least my observation that that every country today is in a mess because they're all pursuing a printing, loose printing presses, a loose fiscal policy. They're all doing the same thing. Uh, so uh, if we were to have again, I repeat, collapse in American dollar, it means the end of the monetary system that we understand, right? And if somebody asks what will happen to price of gold, it will be a meaningless even uh, uh, story because there won't be price of gold. It will be gold, that's all. Gold will be the, 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 the money, let's say, right? But there won't be any other currencies if we have a collapse. So we cannot really uh, talk partially that the American dollar collapses, the rest of the world will be fine. It, it, cannot, it cannot happen from my perspective. So should the investor be looking at um, not diversifying assets among fiat currencies, but holding some gold as a hedge against monetary disorder? Well, I, I always uh, believe that uh, people should have gold as insurance, right? But uh, I, uh, I, uh, I, I, in my analysis, I believe that the gold bucks uh, have overdone as, uh, as far as the uh, gold price is concerned. Because everybody, and in and, and today's session and discussion today, I noticed that everybody was talking about the physical aspects of things, but uh, hardly anything was mentioned about the monetary aspect. Now, you have to bring them together. We also have to remember that we're dealing uh, prices of commodities in American dollar terms, right? But then it's very important to know what happens to American money supply as such, because that they would be talking about American dollars. And my analysis suggests that uh, I don't see any uh, firework as far as gold is concerned. Right? Uh, we were quite accurate for the last year or so in predicting the movement in gold, for instance. Uh, we don't see uh, the foresight research. We don't see any, any major fireworks, uh, all other things being equal, unless there be some kind of a major crisis. But even major crisis doesn't work on gold much. So, but I like gold as an insurance, fine. It, it's always good. And, uh, and again, I, I would stick to what Adrian Day said, try to find quality. Now, whether it's possible in absolute terms to find quality, it's a, it's a big question mark. But if you go for a, uh, like the Arctic of six, that's a dividend yield, it's also a problem because we shouldn't forget that we're all, we're looking at two circles here. One is the paper, paper world circle, the other is real world. Now, the real circle is the most important one. It fits the, the paper world circle. The, all our calculations have been done in the paper world circle, right? In other words, you can, you can analyze company. It looks very great, right, in terms of its ratios, in terms of everything. But if the real stuff, the one which fits the, which we, we don't look at it uh, properly sometimes, shrinks, then the, 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 paper, the paper world collapses. In other words, yeah. I, I believe that you cannot hedge paper with another paper, right? That's, that's my story. So, um, Chris, uh, Frank has just emphasized a point that was made by Adrian that we're seeing uh, global central bank, the U.S. exports inflation, every other central bank inflates along with the Fed. Assets everywhere are expensive. I have read reports that there are housing bubbles in Australia. Where, where does a value investor find something cheap in a world of inflation and asset bubbles? Where do you look? Uh, look high and low, and the, the, the theme that's been raised, I think, is a, is, is a good one, that um, what one finds is less and less attractive. I'm just give you a port de mieux, or if you like, want of a, of a better answer, that in one respect, and bearing in mind some sort of caveats raised uh, in earlier presentations, Australia has overnight, overnight cash rates at the moment of 5.25%, which are relatively high by uh, the standards of English-speaking countries. 
Within that, one has to look. Uh, they're relatively small, but there are, on a 90-day basis, uh, sound firms that will lend uh, or, in effect, will issue commer commercial paper at up to 9% or so. Now, they're not um, rated in any way, shape, or form, but if one looks at them historically, their repayments, these sorts of things would be, if they were S&P or Moody's rated, which they're not, uh, would be on the, in terms of their uh, uh, track records, in terms of their default rates and so on, would be probably close to triple Bs. The question arises as well, on a 90-day basis, like continually can't find uh, more attractive things on a longer-term basis, in effect, am I prepared to lend on what are relatively, um, uh, on a relatively attractive uh, basis? I've been able to do that. My impression in Australia, more than this country, uh, notes tend to be more of a floating rate than a fixed rate, and the points raised in terms of bonds, I fully agree with, with the caveat that they be fixed rate bonds. Uh, a floating rate gives one, a, to some extent, a, a degree of insurance in, in, uh, uh, against uh, rising overnight cash rates. So, long answer to uh, a simple question. The best I've been able to do is, in effect, be a, a short-term lender on what are relatively uh, attractive rates. Uh, unless and until I can find something demonstrably better, which by and large for the past, say, 18 months, two years plus, perhaps even longer than that, I haven't been able to do. Okay, thank you. So uh, China has emerged as a key player in keeping the, the dollar game going. They're willing to keep their currency pegged to the dollar, and in order to do so, they'll print their own money and buy dollar-denominated debt. This means they're exposed to the full effect of any rising dollar commodity prices. Um, Frank, do you have any uh, thoughts on how, how uh, China is at driving world commodity prices? Okay. Well, uh, in fact, uh, I might, may sound uh, uh, perhaps controversial, but I don't believe China drives commodity prices, actually. Right? And it might, may sound very crazy what I'm saying. Uh, again, I repeat, uh, the what determines actually dollar prices is basically the amount of dollars printed. So now what happens is now China happened to have uh, to absorb to get a lot of dollars, right? And somebody can argue now they spend those dollars on commodities, right? And in fact, because the, uh, every every uh, every month they have nice surpluses on current account and they're getting a lot of dollars, they spend them, and this really boosts the prices of uh, of commodities in terms of dollar terms. And that's really the catch here. Now look, let us say China doesn't exist. Or China wouldn't be that important, but American dollars were printed, so somebody else would somebody else would spend those dollars. And because, again, as I suggested, when money is printed, injected, it first of all goes to one market, then it goes to another market, etc., etc. In other words, when dollars are uh, are injected, it it seeks undervalued market, so it will find undervalued market. Once it becomes fully valued, the money will stream elsewhere to another market. So, irrespective of China, as long as you got those dollars. To flow around, they will find the oil market also, because if all the markets are fully valued and oil market wasn't touched, it will be undervalued, and therefore oil prices also will go up, irrespective of China. China, it happened to be that it, it absorbs its dollars from America through export, right? But China does not print dollars. China does not print dollars. Also, China hasn't got the hold on all the dollars that America, America prints. China can create relative price changes to have. Let's say they buy all the copper. But then they won't have enough dollars to buy some other commodities. But even if, if I give the concede this point, I'll say, <coughs> let us say they, they, they got unlimited unlimited dollars, they still don't print them. The printing originates in America. So therefore, a price inflation or commodity price inflation, it's American-made phenomenon. It's got nothing to do with China. China is just happened to be that they are spending them. But it could be any other country. It doesn't yeah. matter. It's not Chinese okay. factory. So, Frank, uh, do you, what uh, degree of credibility do you attach to the thesis that um, China is rapidly industrializing their per capita consumption of all sorts of commodities will be increasing? Meanwhile, many of these commodities have been, uh, there's been a relative lack of investment in um, the productive capacity and exploration of commodities. So that will be an area that will continue to outperform equities and bonds. Okay. Is, um, is China, the, the industrialization of China a driver of commodity demand worldwide? Well, uh, as, I, as I said again, the, the driver of, of commodity demand today 
is the, is the, uh, the printing presses emanated from America, right? Okay. And China happened to have them because they they they, they are running current account services, right? They 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 earning those dollars. But I, I also suggested that if China wouldn't be the church guess it would be Japan or would be some other country, right? Doesn't matter who, as long as you got those dollars, they, they have to come. They, they have to come okay. from the valid market. They would move from market to market. And they would come to the oil market. Okay. Then they would blame India or blame somebody else. I don't know who. But the fact is, printing presses. So, I mean, another way of saying is that um, it's your view that commodity price boom is primarily a monetary phenomenon. There would be anything else for me. It's an American dollar. Okay. Uh, does any, anyone else on the panelists like to take a position on that? Or uh, from what? I observe in, in Brazil, China is on a worldwide buying tour, particularly in Latin America. I've heard also in Canada, buying up natural resources in, in Brazil. They primarily want to safeguard their supply of food. And so the dollars that they have accumulated are being spent. But they are not being spent in the United States. They are being spent, for example, in such countries as Brazil, probably in the future, uh, some deals with Russia too, with Canada, and so on. So this is really an amazing thing that's, that's going on in my, in my view. And, and it will continue. So that, that, let's put it this way. Uh, Japan accumulated the dollar position in terms of an old age insurance scheme. Yep. Uh, Japan knew that its population would get older, relatively older. Home uh, uh, life insurance companies could hardly pay interest rates. So that was the great impulse of Japan to invest in U.S. bonds. And in China, with China, it's totally different. Uh, China fears that when the industrialization process continues, uh, it will run into a huge shortage of oil, other natural resources, and food, and therefore we need this surplus, and now this surplus gets being spent, but not for goods in the United States. On the contrary, China has a huge uh, uh, export uh, surplus with the U.S. Frank, did you have a... No, no, I, 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 I would like a few, I would like to pose another let's say uh, angle to this whole issue okay. of China. Let us say that the United States of America has slowed down money supply, doesn't print it all dollars, right? And Chinese are printing a lot of uh, yuan, plenty of yuan, creating uh, monetary inflation in China. There's a massive aggregate demand increase in China. Uh, what will happen to commodity price in American dollar? They won't move because there's the, the amount of dollars not created any longer, right? Therefore, we'll have stable prices uh, in the world commodity in terms of American dollar terms. Uh, unfortunately, in, in uh, yuan terms, uh, it won't happen because yuan is not international currency in this sense. Nobody, nobody pays pricing commodities in yuan terms. And that's really, again, I repeat, uh, if we ignore the state of supply of dollars, I believe we are doing injustice to our analysis. Okay. So, um... Frank, do you uh, would you care comment on the um, the Bank of China and their printing of their own currency? Is that driving a boom and bust cycle within China, and how will that play out? Well, uh, my my view is that uh, there were a lot of uh, there were so, sorry. Okay, uh, my view is that uh, China uh, had a lot of pluses, and the big plus was the uh, certain uh, freeing from the dictatorship they, they lived and, and they, they got some uh, entrepreneurship, so-called quasi-free economy. This is a massive plus. So they have really generated a lot of wealth. Unfortunately, they're following the, uh, the blueprint of the Keynesian economics, the modern economics, and so they also will be suffering, and they have suffered in the past also from boom-bust cycles. Now, the money supply in Japan until uh, very recently uh, was in a in a, uh, in a region of 20 plus percentage on a year on year basis, the, like M1 for instance, right? And uh, uh, lending also was in, a, in, a, in the 20th regions. Now they have decided to move towards so-called selection, selective type of cooling off of the economy, right? 
and uh, there's no such a thing selective cooling or so-called so- soft landing. Uh, so they have ma- they managed to generate some kind of a softening. Landing has uh, weakened uh, gross momentum from above 20% to around 14%, and we had slight uh, rebound recently. But on balance, I believe that they are in the process of economic bust. Also, if there is going to be a bust there, uh, we will not actually know it because uh, uh, it is still a, a dictatorship. We have to remember this. Uh, and it's very easy to uh, masquerade statistics. Uh, we cannot tell for granted all the figures being published there. My good friend Mark Faber says that most of the figures are manufactured there in any case, right? So we don't really know whether GDP is growing by 7 or 12 percent or whatever. That's not important. The important is direction, right? I believe they're in the process of bust. Uh, and I also believe that they will, not, they will try to go to for so-called soft lending. They will not succeed. And they may have serious trouble because there's an influx of labor from rural areas to urban areas. And this is a major problem for China. They can uh, have like something what happened in the former Soviet Union. It's quite possible. They, they're, they're well aware of all this. Uh, so uh, eventually it will blow up because they'll try to again to inflate a little bit and it will just blow up in their face and that will be the end of the story also in China. It's not, they're, they're, nobody is immune from boom-bust cycles. It's impossible. So uh, suppose China is going through a bust. Their banking system, according to Stratfor research, has um, mountains of bad debt and uh, would be unable to continue to fund economic uh, investment in China as a bust unfolds. So would uh, a bust in China threaten their ability to continue producing things and sending them to the U.S. on credit? Well, that's, this will be a major, major blow like for many countries, particularly America, mm-hmm. because uh, America has benefited from expansion of wealth in China uh, by exchanging uh, pieces of paper for real stuff. And that's, uh, that's, a, uh, that's a great fact. In other words, they were, America was getting something for, and Chinese were getting nothing. And in fact, uh, those pieces of paper are residing at the Federal Reserve of New York, right? The, 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 the Treasury bond, right? And, uh, you know, uh, the moment uh, Chinese will not be in a position to support American real pool of funding or, or, or pool of sustenance, then America could be in serious trouble. I believe that the reason why we had this 10 years so-called economic expansion in, in the United States of America, because of the uh, China-Chinese effect, uh, also former Soviet Union effect, you know, they, they have been partially liberated and they created a lot of wealth, which was transferred, shipped to the United States of America. And you can see it everywhere here, right? So the moment this will happen, this will be very serious for the United States of America itself. Okay. So, uh, Anthony, do you have any thoughts on how uh, boom and bust cycle, it's, say not just in China, but um, anywhere in the world, will affect things for Americans? It looks like as if uh, boom and bust cycle are definitely different in state-controlled economies and on the one hand, and they're definitely different in economies that have, uh, that are in a creditor position as in contrast to those who, which are in a debtor position. As far as we can trust uh, these statistics, uh, China has a huge creditor position and this in my view, allows to flatten any kind of, of turbulence much easier than in the case where a country is in a debtor position. And uh, so for me it's very hard to, to assess uh, the Chinese economy. In one respect it has the typical growth uh, takeoff pattern like that happened in, in the 50s in countries in South America. But on the other hand, and there's also a great, great difference, and this great difference is in fact the debt accumulation. Actually, when we look around in a, in a long-term historical perspective, uh, that uh, take-off countries <coughs> after the, <coughs> the industrialization of Great Britain, like uh, Germany and Japan, they did it in the 19th century without foreign credit. They were very on early export oriented. They very early on were surplus countries. And uh, a region that has not developed 
Latin America has initiated its takeoff phase also in the 19th century and it never, never went anywhere very large and very far because they thought they could grow with debt. And uh, so I think that probably China is on a different uh, trajectory than some other emerging economies. And the, the, the point to compare daringly is the industrialization process of such countries like Germany and Japan, which also did it, uh, let's say, state-guided, uh, state interventionist uh, uh, form. And uh, so, uh, just uh, without any value judgment, just to give an idea of, of where we could see a pattern that is okay. really uh, happening. So, a lot of the commentary on uh, the international monetary system is focused on the willingness of China to subsidize exports and essentially send Americans' goods, as, as Frank just said, in exchange for little pieces of paper. But isn't it also going to be true that if they're devoting a lot of their productive capacity to building factories that can export things that Americans would like to buy but can't afford that doesn't represent a real economic form of growth that will in the end prove to have been a wasteful activity? Well, uh, to com compare it again with the uh, process of uh, development in Latin America, uh, in Latin America, they tried the, the, uh, a policy to, to avoid uh, linkage with, uh, with the world. Uh, so, uh, without uh, being involved in, in, in the, the global market, they were definitely unable to develop, develop own products that could compete. And the way to, to develop uh, whatever s political system uh, you use just in terms of economics is learning by doing. Yeah? The only way you can grow a known industry is really to compare, compare with the best. Yeah? To compare with the best and compete with the best. And uh, that is what, what uh, uh, Germany had done in the 19th century, Japan had done in the 19th century, and what is doing China now. Yeah? getting into the world market, learning, attracting foreign direct investment, gaining know-how, yeah, and yeah, learning how to do business. And at the same time, they are feeling relatively safe with a, 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 a credit deposition which is approaching one trillion US dollars, which is just amazing. Then again, you have... Uh, know-how uh, easily available in, in this area. Uh, the, 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 the foreign Chinese, the, not, not from mainland, are, are, are going into the, the country. Hong Kong forms part of China right now, and Hong Kong is full of um, entrepreneurial spirit. So it's everything in place, in my view. Uh -huh. Okay, so... Uh they're building factories to produce flat panel TVs and sell them to America for uh, on credit, then uh, you think that's a small part of the whole picture and we should really focus on all the capital accumulation and uh, education that's going on there? Uh, I, I was told by an expert, I don't know whether it's true or not, that the only thing that Chinese don't know how to build are cigarettes factories, and for me it was very surprising because it looks like as if cigarettes factories are one of the most complicated things to build in an industrial way. All other things, all other knowledge, knowledge is available in part due to uh, foreign direct investment. Uh, uh, China is very generous with uh, copying the, the system, as is, by the way, a country uh, uh, like Brazil. I mean, uh, there, there is no property right in terms of intellectual property in Brazil as well. These countries are not used to that. And uh, it's just a matter of fact. And China will, will use. Uh, European companies that I've heard of, they accept it. They accept to be, well, uh, stolen in this way. But on the other hand, they feel in this way, that's the only way to gain a foothold in, in these countries and hoping that uh, by and large things, things will change in a way. But I think it's hard to 
to uh, not to see what is really happening as a, a major new economic and political and military entity is emerging. And another, another idea uh, uh, in a long-term perspective, uh, China is not, a, a, in this sense, a developing country. Yeah, China, like, like uh, Japan before, could count on a thousand and two thousand, three thousand years of cultural history. Yeah, this is, there is some, some, some tradition there of knowledge, of science, of poetry, and all these things. It has just not been put into industrial production. So the, 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 the fineness of, of Japanese painting, of Japanese culture, can, could be transformed into transistor radio. And I think it's the same that we have to see in, in China, as it is just an old centuries and thousand years old culture that is now turning to a new way to express itself, just seeing that this is the modern world and that we have to emerge. Mm -hmm. okay. And... Um, do you believe that uh, the United States can, to any extent, use political or military means to perpetuate a financial system that's not sustainable on economic grounds? Well, to a degree, I believe that's what we're doing now uh -huh. in the Middle East. Uh, a while back, I know last spring, there was a lot of talk about, oh, well, uh, people were really, the administration was really worried about uh, Saddam's switch to a uh, Euro-based uh, uh, oil uh, selling system. And, of course, he did make a pretty nice piece of change on that, and it was of concern that all well, these other Middle Eastern nations would notice he made all that money by basing his trade in euros instead of dollars. But, you know, I don't see that as... I would look at it a little differently. I, I think the big problem is they've got to get some collateral under the dollar. I mean, they've just pumped and pumped this money, this credit. There, there's nothing to it. So, you know, to control oil on the margin, and though that's not the only reason, I believe, for our uh, aggression in the Middle East uh, by any means, but it, it certainly is part of the syndrome. Uh, you know, if you don't have this big military and you've been getting all these goods and services for these slips of paper, my goodness, you know, people might want their money back. But you got a big army? Well, maybe they don't want their money back, so after all. What would you say if somebody says, why uh, the U.S. can uh, afford any sort of military activity, they just print the money or borrow it from the rest of the world, and the rest of the world has no choice but to continue to buy more of our debt? Why can that... Can that go on indefinitely? Uh, I, I don't believe it can, no. But uh, it certainly has gone on a pretty long time, hasn't uh -huh. it? <laughs> so what, what would uh, the end of that look like? I don't know. You, you know, you look at this uh, Chinese concept of uh, the mandate from heaven in mm -hmm. order to govern. You know, this monetary system the United States has, in, uh, the fruits of it, which we've enjoyed for so many decades, it's not, I mean, it's more complicated reasons, I believe, than just an economic system or being the largest economy mm -hmm. and these deep liquid markets and all the things that are usually uh, cited. Uh, there was a certain agreement in the world. Uh, I mean, you know, several, gen uh, a couple of generations of Hollywood moguls and all kinds of journalists and other, you know, we really sold this idea of America. We sold it all around the world, and I think people sort of, uh, gee, yeah, these Americans, they're really sharp. They really know what they're doing. Look at that wealth they've created. And, you know, people did defer to us. Uh, I, I don't think that's going to continue. Uh, I, I think the world perceives us very differently, and this is also part of what is going to challenge uh, this dollar standard. And I don't know at what point they get fed up and quit buying the debt. Uh, you know, the economists use this great phrase, the balance of financial terror. Mm -hmm. So I, I don't know the answer, but I really cannot believe it, it's sustainable. Okay. So I have a question that was uh, submitted in the question uh, jar. Is the world moving to a five-currency regime, U.S. dollar, euro, yen, 
Chinese renminbi and the uh, British currency. Um, I think we've heard from Frank on that, that uh, we're not going to go from a system of interlocking fiat currencies to another system of interlocking fiat currencies. The fiat system might simply end and we would be left with gold. Um, Anthony, what, how, how do you see it playing out? Is it? We are, we are definitely moving towards uh, currency areas. Uh, this has been going on uh, since uh, Bretton Woods. Bretton Woods was the first step to create currency, a uh, currency area that time uh, based on the U.S. dollar standard. Then the U.S. dollar standard, the Bretton Woods system, broke down in the late 60s, early 70s, and there was the perspective by the monetarists principally that the free market yeah, would take care of floating currencies all over the world that in the end would be stable. But this did not happen. It did not happen due to many factors. And so we ended a period in the, in the 70s of terribly fluctuating currencies. And all economic areas that were closer uh, united in terms of economic exchange, such particularly the, the Europeans felt the strong, strong, strong need to create specific own monetary system. Other countries, uh, like in Latin America, resorted to some type of dollarization. Yeah. So this is the natural thing that we have been experiencing since the late, uh, since the early 70s. The creation of of currency union and or currency arrangement in different forms. And in this process, uh, the euro is the most advanced. It is a single currency that is made up of different national economies. So in this way, it is different from the United States. And other countries, like China right now, pegs its currency, the yuan, to the to the dollar in this way it forms part, still part, of a, a, a US dollar standard. Now compare that to the situation of Europe in the 1950s and 60s. Uh, uh, in the, at that time there was the Bretton Woods regime, the German mark was pegged to the dollar, the dollar was pegged to the gold. The French franc was pegged to the dollar, the dollar to the gold. That way, the French franc and the German mark had a fixed exchange rate. So they could do business, and the ad ad adaptation was only uh, adjustable. Adjustable bag was, was the term. So for some time, you could calculate. And this was the basis how to integrate the European economies. Without the Bretton Woods system, this dollar standard system, they would not have achieved that. And the moment this system broke down, Officially it broke down in 73, but unofficially de facto it broke down in 70, 71. The Europeans began to construct various systems of currency union, and in the end they felt, uh, particularly after the crisis with the German unification and the German mark in the first couple of years just was too strong, and, and so Britain had to pull out of the system at that time, Spain had to pull out, Italy had to, to, and so on, and only France held together. And so they decided the best way is to create a common currency. Now we have already six years of experience with that. And it, in terms of, of currency, in terms of exchange rates, it has been uh, a system uh, that could be called, one can say, it, it stabilizes the whole thing. Uh, just, just compare. The only alternative uh, up to 99 for uh, many investors who wanted currency diversification to Europe uh, when there were uh, fears about U.S. economy, right, right, they are right now, was to go into the German mark. 
So the German market had to bear all the brunt of a revaluation. This has not happened now. Yeah. So now in the past year, despite all the internal trouble that Germany has due to reunification, which is just a disaster economically, it has been the world export champion. Yeah. More exports to the world than the United States and Japan. This would not have been possible. And the, so it is a, a stabilizing element in more and more regions. See so that. then would you say, is it your view, the world can move through a succession of fiat money systems more or less indefinitely and nothing will, will force their hand to return to a gold-backed monetary system? Well, that is a, a, a difficult question, actually. Uh, who wants among uh, the, the governments uh, a gold standard? You know, uh, there's just not who uh, among the broader population knows about these things. There's actually, in order to, to, to lead to something, you need... Uh, uh, a movement, so to speak, an intellectual movement at, at least. And so in terms of uh, the, the gold standard, I do not see, see that. Uh, the central banks nowadays feel that maybe, maybe a certain amount of gold is not too bad. <laughs> and uh, so there are some differences among various uh, central banks. I feel, for example, when we talk about the European Central Bank, there is a strong gold lobby within the European Central Bank, particularly uh, carried on by the major economies within the Eurozone, uh, France, Germany and Italy. Both are high gold holders and they reluctantly sell gold and probably they won't do. So, you have somewhat of a gold anchor system. And uh, so when, but a, a return to the gold standard, whether we, we like it or not, I'm just uh, trying to be uh, objective in these matters, uh, would be very hard. And I don't see the way, and I don't see the movement, I don't see the political pressure for that. So, Anne, um, can the world go, Anne? Can the world go from uh, one fiat money system to the next, simply adjusting at the margin, writing off debts, patching it here, sweeping a little bit under the rug there? Is that a sustainable path? I don't think it's sustainable. Um, mm -hmm. One thing, I mean, I, I thought what Anthony had to say about the German mark it, within the euro system was very interesting, and I, I wasn't aware of that uh, but I have a lot of problems with the euro. It, it, it seems to me it's, it's an artificial currency, uh, all these different countries, different languages. You don't have labor mo mobility within the system. I mean, Europeans stay put uh, for good reason. I, 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 what do you do when Austria is going, you know, 60 miles per hour and, and uh, Belgium is at 5 miles per hour? You can't. Mm -hmm. I see this as ultimately a dangerous uh, attempt to unite this region uh, politically. So maybe I'm all wet there. Yeah. I'd like to know what Frank has to say okay. about that. With the final thought, as far as I understand, 85% of the reserves of the euro are dollars. So therefore, it's something of a dollar substitute. Frank, actually, I want to change the question a little bit. What do you say that U.S. investor comes to you and says, well, should I diversify my wealth throughout the world, or should I, am I just as well off being entirely invested in dollar-denominated assets? What kind of advice would you give to that person? Well, uh, I mean, uh, I would again, I would suggest that one needs to, in his own, one should look in his own area and to find out uh, the, what he thinks perceived as quality is. In other words, if you see certain things that you like, you just buy it. I mean, uh, it, it's not sort of like, uh, I'm against the, the whole idea that somebody uh, must must be sort of a taking into account whether how risky a particular asset it, it is or whatever the so-called modern portfolio theory. No, uh, one should follow, and that's the nice advice that Mises has given that any investor who, uh, who actually looks first of all at risk and thereafter at the quality of assets will never make money in this sense. He actually will go bankrupt. So you so uh, so one needs 
needs to operate in his area the way the way he operates all the time. And if he finds good quality, doesn't matter where, uh, where in the world, he should buy. He can find good quality even in the worst worst country in the world, right? You know, uh, uh, but 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 again, it's it's up to your own expertise, right? And uh, and nobody can come and give you an advice just like that. Superficially, one can come and tell you, pay attention to dividend yield, pay attention to price integrations. But I view it as a superficial type of things and uh, and not all, not always helpful at all. Uh, one needs to, as Warren Buffett says, go and touch the particular t- assets assets you buy. Don't really buy because it it's, it looks nice in your portfolio, but you go and buy it because. Uh, because you feel comfortable with the management, you, you, you know exactly what you're doing, and then it's fine. And, and, and don't be preoccupied with underlying structural issues, because if we'll start be preoccupied that the world will end tomorrow, then you might as well live in the cave, basically. You know, and uh, that's, that's my advice to this. You know, so nobody can come and, and tell you, as far as I'm concerned, anything else. So Frank, would you say, um, that Austrians, if there's a weakness, that Austrians may get too focused on structural issues that might take a very long time to play out, maybe longer than their investment time horizon. Yeah, I, I believe that uh, Austrian economics uh, uh, can be extremely useful, and uh, I, don't, I, I, I believe that Austrian economics can be used on a short-term basis also, but uh, one has to be very careful not to confuse structural issues uh, with, immediate, uh, with immediate current day life, because if if, uh, if, and Mises also said, look, he says that if you pump money, it sets an economic boom. And then he says eventually it will be bust. But he says himself, uh, economists cannot tell you when it will happen. He says it, right? So therefore he suggested that econo- economics shouldn't be, uh, shouldn't be seen as a science. It's just a philosophy, an art, a way of thinking. It's just modern economists created out of its science and, uh, and uh, oversold themselves. But basically, uh, all, all that we can say keep at the back of your mind if you observe uh, big structural problems you say well uh, it, it is an issue right but it doesn't mean the patient is going to die like you know you, like a patient comes to a doctor and it tells him you got six months to live right that's really what identified then all of a sudden five years later I said hey doctor i'm still alive right you know that's the story about any 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 setup uh, structural issues are important but if you try uh, to use it in a money making operation uh, you can be in serious trouble. Mm-hmm. So you have to look uh, from Austrian perspective, I believe, pay attention to liquidity, for instance, very important because liquidity is the main driver. Pay attention to money. Why? Because money is the business uh, we, we are. Uh, we are buying and selling with money, right? So if you observe that there is a lot of money coming, well, you, you can try to identify where the money will go. That's very useful in the uh, useful activity. And you can track a lot of things with this, right? Uh, you can find out whether whether a particular market will go up or a particular market will go down, and irisp- regardless of the underlying structures. And, uh, and as long as you know that structure is bad, but the money is still there, well, you can go in and out quickly and, uh, and you play. You know? otherwise, otherwise, you might as well stop if you, if you wait for structures to, to eventuate. It may take 50, 60 years. These are contractive cycles, for instance, if you believe in that. So you want to wait 60 years, you buy a particular asset to sell it, then uh, you will lose your investors, your, your fund. You won't get money. So, um, Chris, uh, I think you might be taking Frank's advice and focusing on things that are in your neighborhood. Is, is that uh, how do you look at the subject of internationally diversifying your holdings? I try. I'll, I'll use the phrase kind of a, a, a circle of competence, if you like. Others have, have, have used that or are more eminent and, 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 and whatnot than, than I have. Um, I'd have a difficult enough time, or others with whom I work have a difficult enough time keeping up with uh, things in our neighborhood. That's to say financial developments, um, accounting standards in Australia and New Zealand, let alone um, any other com- uh, country. That's to say there's so many hours in the day, uh, there's only so much one can do. Uh, in terms of answering your question, uh, it may well make sense uh, for people in a part of the world to, uh, to diversify their assets to other countries. Uh, it'll be other people who are far more competent than we are um, to do that. Can I uh, add just a, a tangential point in terms yeah, of yeah. other comments other people have made? Why, are, uh, if you like, uh, are some of the tendencies we've talked about more emphatic 
more extreme in English-speaking countries yes, and elsewhere. Yes, the Anglo-Saxon axis of debt-based consumption right. that you've written about. So I, why, why is that? Well, the short answer is I don't know. Let me take a stab at it. Uh, Could you just uh, maybe say a little more about what it is and then go into your explanation of why? Well, in a, in a very concise way, why is it, for example, that uh, rates of household savings, bearing in mind that these things are, are, are difficult to measure, why do they seem to have fallen more in places like this country, Australia, New Zealand, Canada, and England, than, say, in continental Europe? And there'll be lots of exceptions to that rule, but as a, as, as a crude generalization. Um, why are some of the excesses we've talked about, perhaps more prevalent mm. here, or internet bubbles and the like, potential real estate bubbles, more prevalent, say, in this country and other English-speaking countries than, than elsewhere? I'll take a stab, a phrase, and I've been sitting here pondering as, as whilst listening to other people. Uh, the phrase, the welfare state of credit, is a phrase that... Jim Grant has used on numerous occasions. And what he means by that is a system of regulation extending from a central bank to uh, bank regulators, both public and private, uh, prudential regulators, if you like, to commercial banks, all the way down to consumers. As another general rule, um, the extent to which market forces are permitted, that governments permit market forces uh, to operate, um, English-speaking governments tend to do so a bit more, for example, than European governments. Again, I'm making a generalization there. But as a, as, a, as a crude rule, uh, there's something to be said for that. There's a perversity which emerges from that, though, and basically a big moral hazard, that some of the things which, for example, uh, consumers in Western Europe simply couldn't do, they can do um, in this country, Australia, and other English-speaking uh, countries in terms of the extent to which a bank will permit them to take out gargantuan debt as an individual consumer. Why is that? Well, at least in Australian terms, if you're a bank, you live a very privileged life. You're by both de jure and de facto, you're protected from a foreign takeover, uh, you're protected from a domestic takeover. Uh, if you get into real strife in terms of your lending, you're going to be bailed out by a government. So in other words, why shouldn't you uh, push things to extreme? If you own a corner grocery in Australia and you go out of business, bad luck, no one is going to bail you out, you have no one to blame but yourself. If you're a gargantuan bank, then uh, you'll concoct whatever excuse it is, but by and large, uh, support will be coming your way. So in other words, uh, the benefits, as they would see it, for excess speculation, for excess risk-taking, are there for the simple reason that this welfare, sta welfare state of credit has put a floor under the costs which they mm -hmm. personally, or the banks uh, in terms of the shareholders, uh, are going to have to pay. So uh, the best I can do in terms of uh, that sort of a... Um, uh, English-speaking system, mm. uh, they're sufficiently regulated such that they don't have to bear the consequences of their actions. There exists sufficient freedom uh, of action uh, for them to engage in recklessness. So, um, follow up on that, I, there's, there's a quote I'd like you to respond to. This is from Doug Noland, who's a credit analyst, somewhat Austrian leanings. He says, with uh, credit and liquidity flowing in gross excess from the speculative asset markets to the real economy, the system's entire market pricing structure becomes increasingly impaired over time. The current bubble environment makes it very difficult to determine what sound investment entails. So Chris, you've talked about the value investor is trying to perform some kind of an, a calculus to evaluate investments. The Mises emphasized that Monetary calculation requires sound money. Can you actually do what you do in an environment of m monetary distortion? Perfectly, of course not, or in a, uh, as, as well as one would like to do, of course one can't, but you live in the real world in which these distortions exist, so the, the point becomes, well, given the existing distortions, uh, what principles can you bring to bear? What information can you bring to bear? Uh, what sorts of criteria in terms of what constitutes a risk can you bring to bear in order uh, to invest as well as you can? By investing, I mean outlaying capital with a reasonably or a justifiable prospect of a reasonable return and uh, a modest prospect of, uh, of substantial capital loss. So to elaborate a bit and elaborating perhaps from what other people have said, uh, it's no sin to leave capital on the table or um, uh, unrealized gains on the table. Some of the quotes you've, uh, you've mm -hmm. mentioned there are several years old. I don't criticize the people who have made them at all for making them. I share the sentiments. Um, the inability to time these sorts of things with any, uh, often with any uh, useful degree of, uh, of reli reliability means, it seems to me, that, a, that an Austrian-inspired investor will leave a fair bit of money on this, or has over the past 10 or 15 years left a fair bit of money uh, on the table. That, it seems to me, as, a, as an error, is far preferable 
to the sort of mistakes committed by mainstream folks in 99, 2000, 2001, yeah, yeah. in which that capital, and I'm using that term very loosely, uh, that money is gone, uh, it's not going to return, and uh, people who otherwise might have uh, aspired to such and such a standard of living, they can no longer do so given the gargantuan mistakes uh, and overestimations that were made. So Chris, um, I'm, I'm uh, now um, seeing a linkage to this question from the question jar. Is there a cell discipline associated with the Graham approach? Uh, the short answer is the by discipline is easier to uh, um, express in terms of principles than the sell discipline. Selling is more fraught than buying. I, uh, that, that's actually uh, an excellent question. The best I can do is to say, well, gee, the discipline is not as well defined as the buying discipline. It lends itself, if you like, to leaving money on the table, the point that I, that I just raised. Yeah. Um, the short answer is no, I don't think it, it does to the same extent as the, uh, as the buy discipline. A, a gray mite is, is, tends to be, there'll be exceptions to that, a buy and holder, uh, if the investment remains a sensible one, uh, he's going to tend to, uh, to hold on to it, notwithstanding the fact uh, that prices uh, can rise above, if you like, a, a cost assessment of value. So I'll, I'll be ambiguous there and say that uh, uh, ideally it would, in practice, uh, that discipline perhaps, it, because it's not as easy to define or to express in principles, uh, practicing it isn't going to be as easy uh, as the, mm. if you like, the buy discipline. So Frank, I'm interested in your thoughts on how does how do you determine what is a sound investment in an environment of unsound money? Well, uh, I, I don't. I agree with Chris. I don't think you can establish what sound investment is uh, on this in, in absolute terms, right? In an unsound environment. But uh, all all I would like to add here that uh, my my previous comment when I said that you should be as fast as possible in grabbing money when the central bank prints it, right? So as long as you can get the money before it's eroded, right, and you can use it to your benefit, you'll, you'll be doing fine. Uh, that's a tragedy with the monetary inflation. It's like a race. You know, people are racing all the time, and uh, the, the faster you are, the better it's for you, right? But, uh, but yet, if you know that it's an unsound environment uh, and you uh, abdicate from it, then you're in much bigger trouble. I'll give you an example. For instance, I wrote about this one piece that uh, let's say a builder uh, is in the business of uh, building houses, right? And he is an Austrian economist, and he knows that uh, what Fed, Fed does creates boom-bust cycles. And now, if he will fo would fo were to follow uh, Austrian uh, principles in this sense, literally, then uh, he perhaps, perhaps would have to abdicate from this whole game and he would be out of business altogether, right? The other alternative is to continue to be in this game, right? And uh, eventually will be caught also there. And that's what where Mari Rosbach said, that's the biggest problem with the business cycle, that uh, whether you understand or don't understand, you'll be caught there, right? You, you cannot escape it. Man. That's the problem. That, that's the catch here. That's the tragedy, okay. he said. So and and uh, he, he said that's, that's why he was against having central banks. That's why he was fighting against that, because it's like a nuclear bomb is dropping in you. Can you hide against it? You cannot. So the only thing you can is try to live at the moment as much as you can. If, if you, you observe that you've been attacked by, by embezzlers, well, at, uh, I don't say try, try to join them, but at least uh, try to defend yourself in some particular way. Sometimes you cannot. So, Frank, um, in, in keeping with the idea of get, get to the front of the line, get the new money when it's hot off the press, there's yeah. a young man I read about in uh, the newspaper this week who's purchased, uh, I don't remember whether it's 10 or 23 homes in the Phoenix area, leverage uh, with 10% uh, down, leveraging off his previous portfolio of properties in Las Vegas. Is, is he doing what you're talking about? Look, you know, I mean, uh, put it this way. He, he's probably not a stupid guy. He says, look, uh, I observed the opportunity here. Uh -huh. uh, I, I think, uh, in other words, uh, uh, the, this co corrupt market creates, as Mises suggested, a different type of people, different entrepreneurs who can exploit corrupt environment. Now, uh -huh. it doesn't mean that I'm not talking here about ethics. Now, if we start talking about ethics, Again, we should abdicate the whole thing, right? So we shouldn't be ethical being in this game. We, we know that we're participating, let's say, with thieves. Thieves are controlling the environment. Do I leave this environment or not? I'm part of it. So uh, I'm basically, uh, uh, economically speaking or ethically speaking, I am part of the, uh, part of the cr crime, if you want, right? Because uh, we're saying that uh, anybody who gets the money first, it diverts the real wealth from those who, guys who didn't get the wealth. So I have, should, should be feeling guilty, basically. But if I'll be operating, the, operating this way, then I'll be, and I'll have to live in a cave. Therefore, I'm saying 
you have to play the game. If you can't beat them, you join them. That's all what you can say, unfortunately. So, and I'm wondering if this brings up anything from uh, your experience in Russia uh, in response to Frank's point about when thieves play the game, you uh, have become a thief. Does that bring up anything for you? Yeah, I mean, they made all sorts of adaptations, the Russian people. What was tragic about this, I mean, they did, I mean, of course, they have to survive. So everyone, uh, you know, they kept working at it, working at it, till everybody, even about a six, seven year period, I would say, had found some little niche, which, from a perch, from which they could survive and partially, at least, reconstitute the, the standard of living they had previously. But then, that, you know, then they didn't want anything to change. And that was an unfortunate result. But yes, I think, uh, you know, it, 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 the unsound money, yes, it does uh, uh, empower thieves. It, it, and it, of course, is going to affect the entire culture and society as a consequence. And I guess I have to agree with Frank. You know, you, you really don't want to go under. You want to prosper. So. Okay, thank you. Uh, I think at this point I'd like to take uh, two or three questions from the audience, if anyone has them. You, sir. Flu, sir. Uh, Yeah. Right. Okay. So the, the question is, um, with so much leverage and uh, debt in the system, when it comes to a bust, do we see uh, a deflationary contraction? Um, Anthony, would you like to offer any thoughts on that? Well, I think the first difference is uh, between financial assets, particularly bonds, and real assets. Uh, the bond, when it no longer gets honored, disappears. Yeah, it, it's like never value has been created. In the case of housing, it's somewhat different. The house is still there. So the creditor, in this uh, matter, <clears throat> the bank, will not have its loan as an active on its banking and balance sheet, but it will have at least the collateral, the house. So you will have a Similar situation as I could observe in the United States in the late 80s, early 90s with the SNL crisis, yeah, where you had real estate up for a bargain price for the, because the creditor had to clean their balance sheets. So they will suffer too, but there's still assets there. Now with the government bonds, it will be totally different. If these, uh, if they have to refinance, then in a in a credit crisis, you have the situation that the interest rates will rise sharply, and uh, you have just half of the value and the potential default in terms of a currency reform, which which is something that the history of the world is full. So it would come as a shock to me to think about a currency reform of the United States, but it has happened here before. Yeah? So it's nothing new, and all countries have resorted to that. And even those countries that have some kind of uh, fame to be more stable countries. So when they enter such a crisis, the government will renounce its debt and why? create a new dollar, just like it, it happened in Brazil. Okay, well, what, what would you say? The person says, uh, faced with that, Mr. Bernanke will get in his helicopter <laughs> and start... Just dropping bales of printed notes all over the Well, that's countryside. the inflationary escape, and the inflationary escape leads to ever, ever more increasing prices, and you cannot escape the bust. Uh, in order to make the system go, you have to increase the money supply, increase the money supply, increase the money supply. The economy gets more and more distorted, uh, there's a deviation even uh, uh, in the final and even the, the greatest fool will recognize, let's say even a, a central banker will see the, we cannot go on this way. We have to stop that because it's pure se insanity that is going to happen. And that's the time for the currency reform. Okay. And the history is full of that. Frank, do you have something to say about this? 
Yeah, I, uh, <coughs> I, I personally would not exclude the likelihood of having price deflation. In other words, uh, uh, how it can emerge, I mean, the bubble is uh, the whole economy, every, all the markets, the way I see it, are sitting on a bubble, on a giant, gigantic bubble. So there's no point to exclude property market bubble or any, everything is, uh, is, is, uh, is covered with or, or sits on the bubble. Now, if we were to, and, and this entire bubble, uh, what, what allows it to, to exist is the fact that there is some, something left in the kit, I'm saying, the real, real stuff, re, real stuff. Now, as long as the real stuff is still can support this overall gigantic bubble, uh, we can continue to have happy inflation if you want monetary inflation, and it can last for a long time. Uh, I'm suggesting that perhaps it's the, the kit is not that great. So if it were to stagnate, or God forbid, will start shrinking, then it can have a deflation. What does it mean? That all the credit which was created out of thin air through, uh, through, money, through, through banking system it will evaporate because banks will not renew loans, right? And that all this money, all this credit will be, will disappear. It's all fictitious credit. And the only money which will stay is a very small portion of it. It will be very, 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 very tiny. Uh, that, and therefore, you'll have a massive collapse in prices. Now, this by itself is not a bad story at all. It will, it will undermine, destroy a lot of artificial forms of life. Unfortunately, if we all are part of artificial forms of life, we won't like it because we may suffer also, right? But uh, gradually, this is what Bisi said, is the process of healing. But price deflation, it's uh, very likely, absolutely, it's very likely. And uh, anybody who dismisses it, uh, you know, has to think again. But whether it should happen tomorrow, after tomorrow, that's a different question altogether. So in this environment of uh, credit collapse, what is the asset or uh, entity that an investor can hold on to that will, uh, is it short-term treasury bonds, is it currency notes, is it coins or bullion? What well, can well that... uh, in, in, a, in, a, in a situation of price deflation or such a deep crisis, first of all, we have to realize that uh, the, such a scenario emerges as a result of massive impoverishment. In other words, first of all, things are coming to perspective and it shows you that you are not as wealthy as you thought you are. Therefore, preferences, individuals' preference, what they can afford, uh, consume and live, will be realistic. In other words, uh, you will have to confine to sectors which are catering towards essential needs of individuals. In other words, in, in your language, non-cyclicals. Forget about cyclicals if you want, right? But not just non-cyclicals as such, but very simple stuff. And obviously we'll find that in such an environment there'll be also a luxuries also here and there. We shouldn't forget that in 1930s, oh, 20% of people were unemployed, 80% were employed. Those 80% did extremely well. They did, they did, they had a very good time. Prices were low, they, they, they were accumulating wealth, and they did extremely well. So uh, deflation or price deflation is not the end of the world. On the contrary, it's a process of healing. It's a good stuff. But if you happen to be a part of artificial forms of life, you're in trouble because you were in the wrong, uh, in the wrong business, right? But if you're not, you'll be fine. Anyone else in the audience? So would anyone like to volunteer to answer oh, that? Uh, what, what, uh, okay, I'm sorry. Let me repeat the question. The question is, would any of the panelists like to disclose to what extent, uh, <laughs> say, what percent of their portfolio is, a, is uh, allocated toward gold? Would any panelists like to answer that? Uh, I own gold and gold stocks, but I don't know the percentage. Okay. Gold, big, big pardon. gold produces uh, next to nothing. Uh, gold, physical gold, and/or hedge funds, um, 12 percent. Uh, no, okay. Um, Mark. Uh, Ha, <laughs> <laughs> 
Okay, so I think the question is, uh, can can you trust Putin? And well, I, I mean, he was born into a communist system. He was raised uh, as a communist. So the KGB is sword and shield of the state and the party. So certainly that is his background. Um, the point I was trying to make, and it's very hard for me as an a anarcho-capitalist to support or defend any politician, frankly, but I do see a period of demonization of Mr. Putin ahead, and uh, simply trying to point out that there's a larger story here, and I, I don't, you know, the United States has been so provocative. It, it's amazing to me the restraint Putin has shown. Uh, we pushed and tugged at that country, and really, uh, I, I think until the incidents in Ukraine, he's uh, held back. He hasn't wanted to waste the country's strength in some sort of confrontation. They have a lot of problems in Russia. They really do. And I do think this gentleman would like to solve some of them. Is he uh, uh, the best guy in the world? Do I want to live in, under his government? No. No, I, I'm not maintaining that at all. But it would be understandable that when you are a defector, uh, your capital rises if you make allegations about those left behind. Okay. So I think I'd like to wrap up here by asking each of the panelists to suggest a single uh, investment idea that could either be a stock, a bond, a currency, a commodity, an index, or even, let's say, a country and uh, long or short over the next two years. And you don't need to give an explanation. Just toss it out, and then we'll, we'll wrap up. Chris? Can I dodge the question in this uh, sort of way? Of course. For the simple reason that uh, I have, if I had them, I, I'd hesitate, but I, 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 nothing dramatically obvious comes to mind. Can I perhaps, though, with a serious in intent, leave you with this thought that investors have to sleep at night? that the actions they take, uh, ultimately, uh, are predicated towards sleeping well at night and over a series of nights, hopefully uh, for decades uh, into the future. Um, given that intention, uh, the purpose is not to make a lot of money, whatever that means, whatever your criteria are, uh, over uh, the next year or uh, something of that nature, but to say, look, given that I want to live to a, a ripe old age, given the problems and issues that have been outlined, not just in, in this panel, but in the, the papers today, no doubt, uh, tomorrow as well, uh, are there steps I can take to keep my head above water, um, uh, as opposed to, um, uh, to to make a quick killing? So I recognize I'm, I'm copying the, uh, the question. It's a good question, uh, and I'm copying it because I can't give you a, a surefire, sensible answer. Frank? Well, uh, instead of me spe be specific about uh, particular stocks or, or, or or sectors just like that. Uh, my uh, my view is number one that from a current liquidity perspective, uh, I do not see firework in stock market for some time. In other words, on, on a short term basis, uh, I cannot see sort of a much going on. Right? It doesn't mean that one cannot find situation and opportunities there. But broadly speaking, it's a bit sort of a could be very subdued. Uh, I still like bonds, treasury bonds, and not not because of of some particular reason, just fundamentals, because I believe that uh, the, the, the way the, the markets are looking at, at things, uh, economy, let's say, if my scenario is correct, from second half of this year may soften. Uh, this by itself could be a positive on, on bonds from this perspective. Uh, price inflation, the way they measure, I don't see it accelerating or running away. In fact, it won't surprise me if it's still weakening. And then Greenspan my, may alter its monetary stance altogether. So I view from this perspective as, as, uh, as mildly bullish on bonds. And I also think that one can take advantage of, uh, of the inversion in the yield curve that might, may invert perhaps, right? So one can uh, pay attention to this also, right? And uh, that's really uh, what I can tell you, right? Commodity market, finally, commodity uh, markets. I'm, uh, I believe that uh, uh, from liquidity perspective, we're sitting on a uh, possible uh, correction in a few months' time. Uh, and the best metals, including also gold, I would say. So on a short-term basis, I would be very cautious. Um, base metals and the Commodity Research Bureau Index, uh, that's really what I have to tell you. Anne? I'm, I'm, I'm not warning. I'm just saying that from liquidity perspective, my analysis uh, shows that uh, 
uh, we can have a, a good co downward correction in a few months' time in, in, in commodities like copper and overall base metals. Uh, I, that's what my analysis are suggesting. And likewise, I, uh, as far as gold is concerned, I would like to make a correction. I believe that from liquidity point of view, uh, we're almost approaching towards the, uh, the negative type of area. And maybe we'll have some kind of a mild improvement, but I don't see any fireworks at the moment from liquidity perspective. And would you like to take a shot at this? Uh, well, I don't know about the investment you ought to have right now. My, my remarks were really geared to alerting you. You're going to have some property problems in Russia if you're interested in emerging markets. And probably uh, I would stay away from equities while that is sorted out. And uh, Mr. Putin has demonstrated a determination to make good on Russian debt. So you might think about bonds. Not right now, but down the road. Anthony. I actually like very much agricultural land in Brazil. Uh, in the long-term perspective, given the growth of China, the interest uh, and uh, the, the population growth, and it is one of the very rare, large, large areas of the world where you have sun and water. And this is a unique comp combination. I think there are few other spots in the world of this dimension that have this combination. And add to that uh, new technology, uh, like large-scale agricultural industry, add to that uh, genetic uh, uh, developments and other ways of technical progress that enters uh, this area, I think you, you, you have an amazing uh, uh, value there, which will grow year by year for a longer period of time. Great. Thank you. I'd like us all to thank our panelists for their expertise.